In Isaiah 2 and verse 2, now remember this is right away with Isaiah. He's coming on, he comes on like gangbusters. He comes on strong when he enters the scene. Isaiah 2 and verse 2, and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and, sh and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. So the Isaiah comes on and, and we're going to read something he said, and I think it's in the first chapter in a minute, but he comes on with a powerful message as he comes on the scene. And he says the Lord's house is going to be exalted to the top of the mountains. Now you'll, when you talk about the Lord, he's always, it's always the mountaintop. As a matter of fact, like the song we sang tonight, he is the most high God. Most high. What's that mean? It means no matter how high you go, you look up and he's still higher. Because he is the most high. And so if we're following in the steps of the most high, it would only stand to reason that we would leap on the mountains and skip on the hills, like it says in Song of Solomon. And he said here though, in the last days, which is what we've come to, that the mountain of the Lord's house was established in the top of the mountains. So you got mountains, and then you go higher, and that's where the Lord's house is going to be established, the top of the mountains. Verse 3, and many people are going to go and say, come, let's go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways and will walk in his path. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord will come out of Jerusalem. So what is he saying here? He's saying the, that, he said, first of all, he says, come, let's go up to the mountain. What does that mean when people say, I want to go up to a mountain? Because the word is full of mountaintop references. The word is full of mountaintop living. And so we're going to look at that in a minute. But he says, let's go up to the mountain of the Lord. This isn't just a natural mountain. It's speaking of something. To the house of our God, because the house of our God is on the tops of the mountains. Now, we know the house of God from the New Testament. This, in the old, is just a, a symbol of what the Lord has in the new, which is his people are his house. And they are to be in the top of the mountains, not down in the valleys, not underneath things. They are to be walking on top. He said, you'll be the head and not the tail above only and not beneath. And the law is going to come forth out of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now, when you read the scriptures, sometimes Zion and Jerusalem sound pretty similar. But Zion was the city of David. Jerusalem went out further. So sometimes when everybody was, was doing good, the whole thing could be called Jerusalem or Zion. It would all, that's great. But sometimes when people weren't doing as good, it, Zion would refer to the overcomers, would be the ones that were cleaving to the covenant of the Lord. And out of, the, out of Zion is going to go forth the law. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, when everybody's walking like they should. Now, how, where did this all come from? Well, when David became king, he took the stronghold of Zion. At that time, it was called Jebus. And it looked, it was up on the top of a mountain. It was a fortified city. Looked like nobody could ever take it, but David took it. And that became the city of David. That became... Zion, David's home, and around that he built Jerusalem. So the mountains, what are mountains? Well, when you go up on a mountain, you go up on a high place. When you're up on a high place, you can see far away. When you're up on a high place, it's hard for the enemy to attack you because you can see everything coming. 
when you're up on a mountain, that's a place where you can where you can move with strength. And so a mountain symbolizes all these things. And that is where the city of God is to be built. Now, when David took all of uh, this and began and established his kingdom, and he drove the enemies out of the borders of Israel, then his son came to the fore, and his son built a temple, a house. And this was to be, again, this, uh, this, uh, this Solomon's temple was to be a type of what was going to happen in the new. Remember, these things were all shadows and types and written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world have come. These aren't just some historical facts. These are symbols of something. So David helps Solomon. Solomon is commissioned. He's going to build a temple. Where does he build it? On the high places. He builds it up high in Zion. And how, how does he do it? Well, let's look at just one little part of what it, uh, Solomon took to build that temple. It says in 1 Kings chapter 5 and verse 15, Solomon had three score and ten, 70,000 people that bore burdens. And he had four score thousand hewers. So he had, well, look, he's got 70,000 uh, people that are bearing burdens. And he's got four score thousand hewers in the mountains. What are the hewers? Well, let's read down here. Verse 16. Beside the chief of Solomon's officers, which were over the work, so with all those people we just read about that are being part of building the temple, besides those were the overseers. Besides these were the officers over the work, and there were 3,300 of them, which ruled over the people that wrought in the work. Can you imagine the size of project this was to have tens of thousands of people and, and 3,300 3, people over just overseeing everything that had to be done? And it says in verse 17, And the king commanded, and they brought great stones, costly stones, huge stones, See, it talked about all those hewers, huge stones, to lay the foundation of the house of the Lord. So think about this now. They're, they're, they're going someplace else. They're hewing out, it says, great stones, costly stones, huge stones. I mean, these huge stones, huge, huge stones, and they were had to be so precise that when they got them up the mountain in Jerusalem to where the temple was going to be built, they had to fit exactly. And I'll show you why. Verse 18, And Solomon's builders and Hiram's builders did hew them, and the stone quarterers, stone squarers, thank you, John, so they prepared timber and stones to build the house. And the house, when it was in building, was built of stone made ready before it was brought there. I mean, if you, if you just stop and meditate on this a little and think of the size of work it was to build the temple of the Lord. And, and it says, before it was brought hither, the stone was made ready so that there was neither hammer nor axe, nor any tool of iron heard in the house while it was building. So there was, there was none, none of these tools. When these stones were fitted outside of the house and then they were brought together and they fit perfectly. Now that took the Lord. Yes, you had these people, but this is much like what happened in the building of the tabernacle. God, God would give people wisdom because to take, to take tools, hand tools like this, 
and hew things so accurately that that would all fit together after you'd gotten them on this long journey up, up one of the highest mountains out there. This was an incredible work. And it was done outside of Jerusalem, outside of where it was building. And then the stones came together, stone upon stone, to build the house. Now this is a type of what God is doing now with the body of Christ. Each one of us, it says, are lively stones built together for a house of God. So each one of us has to fit into the structure. Each one of us is hewed by the word and the spirit, sharpened, the rough edges smoothed off, so we can fit together and walk in the unity of the spirit and the unity of the faith to a place that where man he becomes the temple of the living God. Well, for the body of Christ to become the temple of the living God, because as individuals, we are also the temple of God. God lives in us. But God doesn't, he isn't looking for just a bunch of individuals. He is looking to bring together a work that can be growing up like a temple unto, of the Lord and something that is so full of light and glory that it'll it, do what it said here. The, the word of the Lord will come out of Jerusalem. The, the law will go forth from Zion and the nations will come to it. Their testimony all over the world because they fit together. Now, that doesn't mean he's going to bring us all to one physical geographical place and see if we all fit together. It means because we are linked together by the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the Holy Ghost, by the spirit of the Most High God, that we, as we do our parts, wherever we are, we are functioning with everybody else that's doing the same thing and is pushing this edifice till it grows to a holy temple in the Lord. That's what it's talking about here. That's what God way back in David's time was saying, look, David is a type of Christ. He's all David or Jesus was called the son of David. What did David do? He got the victory for the whole land. But when he had gotten the victory, it was so they could build a temple to the Lord on Mount Zion. It was so that they could establish the dwelling place of the Lord. And that's the same thing now. Jesus won the victory, but he didn't just won the victory for victory's sake. He won it because he has a purpose, which is to build a holy temple in the Lord. Amen. And the body is to be built together unto a perfect man unto a perfect temple in the Lord. Ezekiel verse, or chapter 40. In the visions of God brought he me into the land of Israel, and he set me upon a very high mountain. So we know now, see, when God wanted to teach something, he took people up into a very high mountain so they could see clearly. He took me up into a very high mountain, by which was as the frame of a city on the south. So he said, he got up on this high mountain, he looked and there was, kind of looked like a city on the south. And he brought me thither, Ezekiel 40 and verse 3, and behold, there was a man. And his appearance was as the appearance of brass, and a line of flax was in his hand, and a measuring reed, and he stood in the gate. So as Ezekiel in this vision of, on the high places of God approached the city on a hill, there was a man that said, you had, in order to go there, he had to pass by this man that had a, flat, had a line of flax and a measuring reed. <coughs> this reminds you then of Revelation, where it says, in Revelation 11, where he saw a man with a reed like a measuring rod. God is measuring his temple. <laughs> they had to measure very precisely for the temple to fit together in the days of Solomon. Now, it's the same thing. That was a type and a symbol. It's the same thing. God is measuring his people to see if they can fit to a holy temple in the Lord. Read, and he stood in the gate. 
thou son of man showed and uh, the Lord showed him some things and then he said thou son of man in verse 10 show the house to the house of Israel in other words what I've shown you you I'm sorry verse 4 chapter 43 and verse 10 shows him a couple of chapters of details and then in 43 10 he says you son of man show this house to the house of Israel that they may be ashamed of their iniquities and let them measure the pattern he said show them show them what I've laid out and then let them measure themselves against the pattern verse 12 this is the law of the house of the Lord in the top of the mountain upon the top of the mountain the whole limit thereof round about shall be most holy behold this is the law of the house so, so Ezekiel sees this building this temple and he says and he says the law of the top of the mountain is all of this and the ground around it is holy ground that's the law that was it must be holy so not only does it have to measure up but it must be holy because without holiness no man will see the Lord Isaiah and in chapter 56 it says also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord so he, this is back before he brought the Gentiles in in the days after Jesus it says but he said look the stranger that joins themselves to the Lord that loves the name of the Lord to be his servants everyone that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it and takes hold of my covenant the Lord said even if they're not born in Israel if they take hold if they love me and they take hold of my covenant he says they are welcome Isaiah 56 7 even them will I bring to what my holy mountain and make them joyful where in my house in my house of prayer he calls it their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar for my house will be called a house of prayer for all people which is what Jesus said when he quoted this so the Lord he didn't he has the law going out of Zion and the word of the Lord the word of the Lord coming out of Zion and Jerusalem he has it for all people this isn't just for a select he didn't just pick the Jewish nation he has a salvation that reaches out to everyone and this holy mountain is for those that love his covenant that take hold of it that love the Lord their God he said welcome them in they measure up so mountains we've seen they mean strength they're something permanent and they're the high points now let's look at this a little bit closer because we're gonna see the New Testament is full of mountaintop experiences again this is for our instruction upon whom the ends of the world have come it's because the Lord wants us to live in the high places of the spirit the high places of the word not down here bound up with the earthly Revelation chapter 7 and verse 7 and the angel said to me where did you marvel I'll tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her which has the seven heads and the ten horns verse 8 and here is the mind that has wisdom listen now does your mind have wisdom the seven heads Revelation 17 and verse 9 here is the mind that has wisdom the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth now back in in the old days Rome was called the you know is the city of the seven hills it sat and they even had in their coins what looked like a woman sitting upon these mountains we know in the scripture here he's talking about Babylon and the seven heads it says 
are the seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are, verse 10, and there are seven kings. Five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come, and when it comes, he must continue a short space. So what is he saying? He said these mountains symbolize the seven kingdoms. So not only is a mountain a place of strength, it, it can represent the strength of a kingdom, the authority of a kingdom, not necessarily, now we're not talking about Mount Zion here, we're talking about seven strong points of man's kingdom, therefore Satan's kingdom, and the woman sits upon these high authorities, these world governments. It says in Luke chapter 4 and verse 5, now you understand this, the mountains not only are high, not only are strength, but they also represent kings, kingdoms, authorities. And in Luke 4 and verse 5, and the devil took Jesus after he's filled with the Holy Ghost, where? To a high mountain. Not the highest, just a high mountain. And he showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. So the devil takes Jesus to a high place. Because again, when you get up high, you can see further. And he showed him all the kingdoms of the world. All the little mountains. You know, in the scripture, it talks some places about this is, this is the, uh, it's like the peak of the hills. Because it would be a mountaintop surrounded by hilltops. Well, in this case, he goes up to a place and he can see all the kingdoms of the world, all the mountains of man. And he said he saw them in a moment of time. And it says in verse, verse 6, And the devil said to him, to Jesus, All this power will I give thee. So you see, that's the authority, the power of a government. A mountain is something that is permanent. And it's a, it is a power that can, you can wage war out of a mountain. He said, now I, all this power will I give thee, and the glory of them. For that is delivered to me, and whomsoever I will I give it. So all these kingdoms, all these mountains of men, they have all, and all the glory that it seems to have, whether it's, whether it's military might, or riches, or oil under the ground, whatever it might be, it's all Satan's kingdom, and he says, I deliver this to whom I will. Now, and he said, this is, these are the mountains that the woman is sitting on. She is sitting on the seven mountains of the enemy. These are the high places of the enemy. Now, God has something that is the most high mountain. It's the holy mountain. This is not a holy mountain. He said he would have to bow down to the devil to get to climb these mountains. And he wasn't going to do it. Our God now, he is the God of the mountains. And all throughout the word, he takes his people to the mountains when he, A, wants to teach them, and B, when he wants to bring a higher revelation, wants to bring them up into something. Like it says in the Song of Solomon, Come away with me, my beloved. Rise up, my beloved. Come away. I want you to come up because I am the most high. I'm above all. So what did God do after he got the people out of the land of Egypt? He took them to a mountain, a mountain that flamed and spoke. And out of that came the, what we know as the Ten Commandments and the great revelation of the, of the tabernacle and the things God was going to do for his people, all brought supernaturally, but all brought from the mountain. Because God teaches on the mountains. People say, oh, God took me down in the valley to teach me something. Well, guess what? God in the Word takes them up on the mountain to teach them something. And if you're up on the mountain learning, you don't end up down in the valley. You end up Leaping from the mountains, skipping, skipping on the hills. So when he wanted to teach his people, he brought them to Sinai. When David took over as king, finally, here, here was a man after God's own heart. He took over after king. What did David do? 
He took Jebus, which became Zion, which became, and the temple was built there, on the mountain of the Lord. So you see, God, God was teaching Jerusalem, look, this is where we worship me. Because remember, they had to come to Jerusalem for the great feasts. Yeah, but where was that? That meant they had to come up on the mountain of the Lord. They had to come up in the high points of God. In uh, the most, one of the most famous sermons of history was spoken on a mountain. As a matter of fact, people call it the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus, when he wanted to preach a revelation to the people, he brought them a sermon where? From the mountain. Because the word is going to come forth from the mountains of the Lord. And it will go out to the people. So the most famous sermon was preached on a mountain. When it was time to pray, what does it say? Many times it says, and Jesus went up into a mountain to pray. And where was he when he, when he prayed that great prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane? It was on the Mount of Olives. It was on a mountain. The great prayer was prayed on a mountain because God is the God of the mountains. And when Jesus wanted to show his disciples what was coming and the magnificence and glory that he was to come into, what did he do? He took them to the mountain of transfiguration. He took them up on a mountain and his glory was seen before him. Even the, the glory cloud came upon him. It comes in the mountains. When Jesus died, he died on a mountain, Golgotha. When Jesus, when Jesus came out of that tomb, as now he has, he has descended into the lower parts of the earth, and now what is he going to do? He's going to ascend up on high, higher than the highest heaven, given a name above every name. He is the most, he is standing with the most high in the high places of God. This is the God that we serve, the God of the mountaintops. And his house is being built where he is on the mountaintops. Isaiah 25 and verse 6. We're going to talk, we're, now we're going back talking about him ascending. Isaiah 25, 6. And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make to all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of wines on the lees well refined. So you're going to make a big feast on this mountain. And it says in verse 7 of Isaiah 25, And he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people, and the veil that is spread upon all nations. He said in this mountain, he's going to destroy the covering that's been cast over all people. Verse, what is that covering? Verse 8. He will swallow up death in victory. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces. And the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth. For the Lord has spoken it. What's he going to do? When he ascends up on high, he leads captivity captive. He gives gifts to men and he destroys. It says, death, where is your victory? Grave, where is your sting? It said right here, he's going to make a feast to all nations on that mountain and he will swallow up death, that great covering that has been cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. Jesus destroyed the power of death. It will not have dominion over you. Sin will not have dominion over. He broke all that and smashed through it and brought us to a place above all of that. It says in Psalm 68 and verse 16, Why leap you, you high hills? This is the hill which God desires to dwell in. Yea, the Lord will dwell in it forever. So you high hills, what are you, what are you leaping for? Because this is the hill that God desires to dwell in. It says in verse uh, in verse 17, the next verse, the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. 
the Lord is among them, as in Sinai in his holy place. So what is he saying here? He's saying, as you ascend above the hills, you see a mountain, and now out of that comes a char the 20,000 chariots of God, thousands of angels. In verse 18, you have ascended up on high. You have led captivity captive. You have received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. Leap, you hills. Jesus has ascended at the right hand of the Father. Jesus has gone to a place where he is surrounded by the chariots of God, 20,000 strong, even thousands of angels. He has ascended on high. He has ascended up the hill of the Lord and led captivity captive. This is Ephesians 4 in the Old Testament. He's ascended up on high, he's led captivity captive. He gave gifts to men. That's a direct quote from Psalm 68. He ascended on high, the most high God. When Abram, when Abram came in on the scene, it says in Hebrews 11 and verse 10, that he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. This is what Abram did. And this is he, he went out not knowing even where he went, but he knew one thing. He was looking for a heavenly city. He was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. And you know, we look at that and we say, oh man, I'm just a pilgrim. I'm looking for the heavenly city. But you know what? There's another side to this. Yes, we want a city whose foundation is the holy mountains. But you know, God is looking for a city also. God is looking for a city. Abram was looking for a city of God. God is looking for a city. It's now, remember I told you when Isaiah came on the scene, he came on strong. And this is what it says in Isaiah 121. How is the faithful city become a harlot? It was full of judgment, righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. How has the faithful city become a harlot? God is looking for a faithful city. Think of, think if God would send a prophet into a church today. And of course, most churches don't have too many new members. So they see the guy and they go, well, how'd you find out about us? What are you doing here? And he says, I'm looking for the faithful city. I'm looking for the ones on the Lord's side. See, that is what God is doing. The eyes of the Lord search to and fro throughout the earth to find the hearts that are perfect toward him. Where is the faithful city? Where are those that love the Lord thy God, that cleave to the covenant? It says in um, 1 Samuel 2 and verse 35, And I will raise me up a faithful priest. Remember, he's, God is looking for a faithful city. And in Samuel he says, And I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in my heart and in my mind and I will build him a sure house and he will walk before mine anointed forever see God he when he looks out one of the things we noticed was that the you hear songs you hear people talking and it's all me 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 this is what I want this is what I want to do blah 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 won't God bless me well God will bless but it says here now God is looking for someone. He's looking for someone that is faithful, whose heart and mind are his heart and mind, not theirs, his. We die, he lives. Psalm 10, uh, 101 and verse 6. Mine eyes, the Lord says, shall be on the faithful of the land, you want God's eyes to be on you? 
You want them to watch over you? Be faithful. That they may dwell with me, that they may dwell with me. He that walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve me. He laid it out right here, the Lord. This is what he's looking for. We might be looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. God is looking for a faithful city who will stand on his word and be true to his covenant. In Revelation 17 and 14, these shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For they that are with him are what? Called, chosen, and faithful. The faithful city, that's what the Lord is looking for. How has the faithful city become a harlot? Where is that faithful city? It says in Revelation 19.11, who is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, God's Son, who is the image of the invisible God, who is the perfect expression of the Lord? It says in Revelation 19.11, and I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him was called what? Faithful, faithful and true. In righteousness he doth judge and make war. Jesus was faithful to him that called him. He was faithful to the covenant. He was faithful to the word of the Lord. He was faithful to his father. And he's saying, where's the people like that? That is, that is who I'm going to make my holy city. That's who's going to dwell in Zion, are the faithful of the Lord. It says in Hebrews 12 and verse 18. Now remember, we've been talking about how these things from the Old Testament are shadows and types of the real thing. It says in Hebrews 12, 18, For you're not come to the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire, or, black, or to blackness and darkness and tempest, he says, you're not coming to a physical mountain. When I talk about bringing you into the heights, into the mountains of the Lord, it's not a physical mountain. You're not coming to Mount Sinai. And they came not only to the, the burn with fire and blackness and tempest, and it says in verse uh, 19, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more. So here was this first group that God had called out to be a, a holy nation. And when they heard how strong the word was coming, they said, no, we, we don't want to hear that anymore. And as a matter of fact, next verse says, for they could not endure that which was commanded. See, you cannot keep the commandments of God in perfection, in faithfulness, in the natural. They could not endure that which was commanded, but we haven't come to that mountain. We have come to the mountain of those who have the word written in their hearts and souls, who have been born again, who are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Verse 22, but you are come to Mount Zion. We've come to the mountain, the high points of God, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. Well, of course we have because we are in Christ Jesus who ascended up and high where there's thousands of angels, where the chariots of God are, where the power of God comes forth. And given that, and given that, that our heart has been changed by the New Testament in the blood of Jesus and regenerated and changed, we can be faithful to perfection, the very thing the Psalm said. You say, will that ever happen? Well, let's take one more scripture here. Revelation 21 and verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city. Ezekiel saw the holy city, and, he'd had to, and he was to bring that pattern to Israel that they might measure themselves. John now 
the very end of the book of Revelation, I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. John saw the faithful city. The ones that are with him are faithful and true like the Lord was. And you know what he had to do? No matter where the Lord had lifted him up, he still had to look up because Jerusalem was coming down from heaven, down from the realm of the Most High, down to where John could look at that and then describe the beauties of the city of God. Saints, where is the faithful city? Faithful. Who is on the Lord's side? Who has a covenant in their heart? Who's going to ascend? Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand on Mount Zion with the Lamb? Those that have clean hands and a pure heart. Those that love the Lord and those that dwell in the high points of God. That's what we want to do. Praise the Lord. No.